أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آله محمد رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يخفه قولي So tonight uh, we continue with the course of uh, ولاية and uh, we'll move on to from what we've discussed before. So we've, and we've introduced the theory of Yuzutsu in language, and we've dealt with the semantic fields, and we've dealt with the key words and the focus words, and we saw how language is based on uh, webs of, of different fields connected with one another, basically words gaining meaning uh, when they're connected to other words in that language system. And we're going to take that and employ it in the Qur'an when we deal with the concept of wilaya. So we're going to begin today with discussing wilaya from a linguistic point of view, and then we're going to move on to wilaya in the Qur'an, inshallah. So we'll begin with the slides right now, and uh, inshallah we can uh, uh, move on to that. Um, so we're going to enter the uh, etymology of, and, and the Qur'an with regards to wilaya. And we'll begin with the etymology. The Arabic root for wilaya is walaya. Wal, lam, and ya, alif, walaya. And Arabic roots usually have those three letters where all the other words are derived. And From this, from this root, walaya, we have different types of derivations. We have wali, we have wali, this line on top of the letter in English is basically the med. So basically when you have uh, ya, or you have a kasra, to differentiate between those two, a kasra will be a very short uh, syllable, basically uh, bait, baiti. You can say bait, house, baiti, uh, house as well. Baiti, if you prolong it, extend the end of it, that would mean possession basically. That would be a ya and not just a kasra. So that, that denotes that. So this is wali, and this is wali, and that's maula, muwali, wilaya, walaya. So maula being master, uh, wilaya, authority, guardianship, and whatnot. Wali is the governor. Wali is the vicegerent or go also governor as well in a sense. So all these words are derived from this one root. Walaya. Everything is derived from this. So we have to understand what the root is referring to. And then we can understand the derivations that come from that word as well. Um, the linguistic meaning of the original walaya is nearness. So walaya is referring to some sort of nearness. And if we talk about nearness, we're talking about something that has like a relative relationship. And when we talk about something with a relative relationship, there has to be something that should be related to another. So if I talk about myself being far from the table. So there's me and there's the table. And then if I want to talk about my nearness, I would move closer and I'm closer to the table. So my, the distance or the relationship between uh, me and the table is basically uh, what gives meaning to any relational uh, relationship. So if there, there aren't two objects, we can't really describe this nearness or farness unless we have those two. So, when we say wali, and we say that it talks about nearness, then automatically we say that it involves two or more things. Um, other meanings that are derived from wali uh, is having dominion over something. To have wilaya over something, meaning to have dominion over it. Uh, lordship. So again, keep in mind, this is a relational uh, word in this sense. There, there are... Uh, there's a relation between two different things over here. Lordship is another meaning of wilayah. Sanctity. 
is another one. Guardianship is another one. Being a master, ruler, friend, and intimate is, are, are other meanings for this word. Now, if we go to one of the famous dictionaries we have, al raghib al-Asfahani has Al-Mufradat. Al-Mufradat is a book that uh, is basically a Quranic dictionary. Al-Mufradat fi al-Fad al-Quran al-Kareem. And it's one of the main references that are used when trying to understand the Quranic words and usages. Because what he does in that book is, he takes the words and he tries to understand them within the Quranic context. So, Al-Raqib says, Al-Wala'u wa tawali an yahsula shay'ani fasa'idan husulan laysa baynahuma ma laysa minhuma. So, Al-Wala'u wa tawali, derived from Walaya, is for two or more things. So, basically, there has to be two or more things to become, I mean here becoming in the philosophical sense, in such a manner that what is between them is from them. So that which separates them is actually part of them themselves. That's how intimate they are, that's how close they are, that what's, what distinguishes them from one another is actually part of them, not something separate from them. Um, so therefore, there's an affinity between the two that occurs by removing the barrier that sets them apart from one another. So you become close to someone and you, you say, this is my soulmate, or this is like, this is, you know, he's just like me. Although you're two separate individuals, but you're so close and bonded with one another that you uh, act as if there's no barrier between you two. I mean, the barrier that is between you two is actually your own selves. That relationship that you have is what separates you and what unites you is at the same time. So it talks about a very close type of nearness. Um, wilaya can be pronounced as wilaya and can also be pronounced as walaya. Each meaning something different. And we're going to go into the details of the difference in a little bit. Now, when we talk about relationships, and we look at the uh, different types of individuals who are in that relationship, we see that there are two types of relationships that Wilaya denotes. The first type is the unequal relationships. Equal meaning being on the same level. And then we have what we term as the equal uh, relationships. So when you have a father and you have a son, the father has dominion and has authority in this relationship. So there's a connection between the father and the son, the guardianship, let's say, but the father is the one who's responsible of the son and not vice versa. Another example is the role, the Lord and the servant. The Lord has ownership or he has uh, governance over the servant uh, and not vice versa. You have the ruler and the subject and you have the patron and you have the client. And then you have a different type of relationship where you don't have this basically like a hierarchy. Uh, you don't have one that's dominion, uh, has dominion over the other. Um, they're basically on par, same level. And the relationship that we can imagine in this case would be friendship. So when you're a friend with someone, you're not really above that individual. You share equal status in this relationship. There's no dominion over, uh, from one person over the other person. Um, and this is important because uh, wilaya, in a sense, denotes, let's say, the authority of the master over his slave, in a sense. Back in, in if you read the legal text of, of the past, uh, the slave owner had authority, ownership over his servant. And uh, the father had authority over his son and his wife and his daughter and his children. Um, and they didn't have any authority over him. So, uh, the relationship that we have with God, for example, where does that fit into this category? Is it the type of relationship where you become equal with God in terms of the reciprocity in this relationship? Or does God always maintain some sort of uh, higher authority over you? What does it denote? And uh, we'll, we'll go into that, inshallah, when we uh, deal with uh, Sufism and, and other types of things.
Um, the peculiarity of the rule wali. Both parties to these various relationships, even those of non-symmetrical character, basically the friends, can be designated as mawla. This is something peculiar to the word wali. So basically, the two sides in the relationship are described as, with the same word. So the master is a wali, and the servant is a wali as well. Allah is a wali of the people, and the people are awliyaullah. Allah waliyu alladheena amanu wa mu'minuna awliyaullah. They're both designated by the same word, which again emphasizes the fact that if you become so close to someone that you describe the relationship in the same word, it's as if you're not distinguishing between the two. So both Lord and Master and dependent and servant are described as mawla. Allah inna awliya Allah la khawfun alayhim wa lahum yahzanun. Behold, truly the awliya, which is a plural of wali, of God, no fear shall come upon them nor shall they grieve. Wallahu waliyun mu'mineen in another verse. And God is the wali of the believers. So God is a wali and the people who are uh, believers are the walis of God, basically. Now, if we move on to the Qur'an, and we want to see the role or the position of wilaya and what it plays in the Qur'an, we will see that there are many verses that deal with this concept. And when we notice the number of verses, which is over 200, that mention the root, root word wali and the derivations, we begin to see that the term wilaya becomes a focus word in the Qur'an. Because of the abundant amount or the ample amount of times it's mentioned in the Qur'an, we begin to understand that there's a lot of themes that the Qur'an bases uh, reality or realities upon uh, when it comes to wilaya. If some word is mentioned about five, six times, or it's always, always peripheral, then you wouldn't consider it to be a focus word. But when you see it mentioned so many times, and is given the central importance in the verse and in the whole situation, then you understand that this is a focus word. So, wilaya, in order to understand in the Quranic context, what would we have to do? We have to go and begin finding out what the keywords are, right? Because we said that defining a word uh, can only happen by looking into the keywords that surround that word. And thus we can understand the relationship that they have, and therefore wilaya begins to gain a meaning. So, when wilaya is a focus word, what are the words that surround it? What are the key words that surround it? And what are the other focus words that have wilaya as a key word for them? That would give us a better understanding of what wilaya means in the Quran. Now, if we look at the types of wilaya relationship in the Quran, we see that there are positive relationships and there are negative relationships. We see that God at times describes God himself as a wali. That's positive. And again, this is all going back to Izutsu's theory on linguistics where the focus word has keywords and keywords are either positive or negative in most cases. So God would be the positive notion or keyword that's connected to wilaya. The prophet as well. He's also described as a wali in the Quran. The believers are also described as awliya in the Qur'an. So this is the positive aspect of wilaya. Um, on the other hand, we have the negative as well. Satan, as opposed to God, is also described as a wali in the Qur'an. Satan's, um, there shouldn't have been a, oh, Satan's helpers um, are also described as awliya in the Qur'an. And the disbelievers are also awliya in the Qur'an. So th these represent the negative aspect and this is the positive one. And remember we talked about the Qur'an always using this dichotomy, always contrasting its notions with, its, uh, with their opposites. It's like this, uh, this two struggle between the good and evil, light and darkness. Um, if we look at the time before Islam and we want to understand the word wilaya before the Qur'an came about. Because obviously if you ever want to understand the word, you have to try to understand it in its historical context and its development. So what did the word wali denote before 
Islam, basically in an era of Arab paganism. Well, it denoted temporal authority. A person who had, let's say, a slave master and a slave owner was a wali of the slave. Or a governor, a wali, uh, a governor of a city. That was a wali. And it wasn't much more than that. So, wilaya didn't play a central role in, in the thought of, of Arab pagans. So basically Arabs before Islam did not consider the word wilaya as having a central role in their world view and in their belief system. It was just a word that is like any other uh, mundane word. It had, didn't have any meaning, any value other than the specific context that it, you know, it wasn't something that was passed around. It didn't talk about relationship between the humans and their lords and their deities. It didn't talk about relationship uh, 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 values or uh, hierarchies in the relationship. But when, it, when the Qur'an came, when Islam came, it rendered wilaya as a central concept in its worldview. Wilaya began uh, getting a very important role in describing the relationship between human beings, one another, humans and God, Satan and his followers, and the non-believers between one another. So we're going to see how this concept began developing and taking a central role and it became instilled in people's minds that everything in this world that they should be doing should be based on this notion of wilaya. So one of the verses that God talks about is Behold, unto God belongs a pure religion. Unto God belongs the pure religion and those who take protectors, basically awliya has been translated as protectors over here, apart from him say, we do not worship them, save to bring us nigh in nearness unto God. So, they, God is describing even the relationship between the disbelievers and their idols and their deities as uh, wilaya. Whoever took awliya uh, other than God. So he's describing, the, even though they might not have described it that way, they did not describe their relationship with their lords as wilaya, God is describing it that way. Because he wants to create a cohesive, coherent notion here that any relationship that you have in this world is based on the idea of wilaya. And every relationship that you have should be a sacred one in a sense and should not be uh, 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 connected to something that's evil let's say so you are responsible for your relationships if you are taking a deity other than God or using them as uh, intermediaries that relationship between that deity has to be uh, taken seriously and you have to understand whether this relationship is something that's good or evil um, so the relationship between pagans and pre-Islamic Arabs with their gods was not founded upon the concept of wilaya. It involved notions such as sacrifice, rituals, intercessions, uh, you know, praying for uh, rain. Uh, they, they had duties, sacrificing animals for them so that they can thank them. Um, it was more of that type of relationship. And there wasn't no intimate connection, no existential uh, connection between the heart, the soul, and that person that you are uh, uh, worshipping or dealing with in your daily lives. There was no spiritual journey by which a human reaches spiritual perfection through worship and submission to the Absolute God, Allah. So the relationship between the deities wasn't one founded upon a spiritual journey. Why, why do you find in Islam specifically a talk about moving towards Allah, journeying towards Allah, getting closer to Allah? These are concepts that didn't come out of nowhere. Islam came and embedded these in the Quran. And the way it did that was by developing these notions and building a coherent and cohesive understanding of the relationships between different beings in existence. Once you build that relationship, then you can speak about journeying. When you talk about me wanting to reach proximity to God, basically God in your mind is something that you can reach to or you can reach. You can move towards. How does this movement happen? It happens spiritually. So these are notions that Islam introduced that were foreign to these individuals. 
their relationship with their deities didn't involve this movement, didn't involve this relationship with them. So if you had an idol, you weren't thinking that you're going to become one with this idol and then you become one with existence. That's not how they understood the world. That's not how they understood the things around them. When you had a, let's say in Sufism, you have a master. In Shiism, you have the Imam. The closer you get to the Imam, the closer you get to God. You have to obey the Imam, because if you obey the Imam, you're obeying God, and therefore you're becoming closer to God. These are all notions that are, exist in our minds now, but did not exist in the minds of people before. And the, the reason why they exist now is because of this introduction by, the, by God and the Imams, and giving these notions centrality in our worldview and our understanding of reality. So, God becomes an active agent deeply involved in human affairs, as opposed to standing aloof from mankind, either subsisting in his glorious self-sufficing solitude, or carrying out duties external to mankind. This is taken from uh, Yisutsu's book as well. Um, so God becomes someone involved in your life. Every moment you have to be God wary. You have to be aware of his existence. If you lie to someone, you anger God, or you bother. If you uh, are truthful and honest. God is watching you. Every good deed you perform is a step closer to God. Every bad deed you perform is a step away from God. Before that, God wasn't involved in human affairs. People weren't aware of his presence in their daily lives. He was subsisting in his own glorious, self-sufficing solitude. So God existed on his own and he's enjoying his own solitude. Nothing to do with us. Um, the challenge of the Prophet and the Imams was to alter this understanding of wilaya from temporal authority, tribalism, monarchy, because again, why temporal authority, tribalism, and monarchy? Because it wasn't related to God. They're trying to put this notion, connect it with God, instead of limiting it to temporal authority, tribalism, monarchy, and so on and so forth, and create a new system of belief with wilaya at the core of Tawheed. You say God, you say wilaya. God has wilaya over everything. And through wilaya, everything happens. The dispute over caliphate, which is the essential difference between the Shi'is and their uh, uh, opponents, was precisely because of this conception or misconception of wilaya. The Shi'is saw a certain understanding of wilaya of God and how it continues and subsists through existence, and how it is transferred to the Prophet. And from the Prophet, this wilaya cannot end. As long as the world exists, as long as existence is there, if you equate existence with wilaya, then there's never a moment where wilaya does not exist. So the Shi'is, at least even uh, on, on, in, in later uh, centuries, um, argued that because wilaya is a continuous reality um, and uh, it's connected to existence, then it always continues. It doesn't end with the Prophet's demise. Sufis understand that. Sunnis, Sunni Sufis understood that. So that's why they came and said that wilaya continues through their aqtab, basically, the poles, uh, the head figures of Sufism. So the difference between Shias and Sunnis and Sufis, Sunni Sufis in this aspect is not that wilaya doesn't persist or exist uh, eternally, but that who does it exist in? Who is the representation of that wilaya? Where is wilaya manifesting at the current time? And even within Su Su Sunni Sufis themselves, you have differences. You have some, um, for example, if you go to the Jundi in his Insan al Kamil, he talks about the wilaya belonging to the 12 Imams even though he belongs to the Sunni school of thought. You have others that talk about it being part of all the aqtab, specifically the imams, but the imams pass it on to these other awliya, these other saints. So it's always continuous. And we're going to go into detail about that type of wilaya when we discuss Sufism and wilaya. Um, almost all the Muslims, including the companions and supporters of, of Imam Ali, were still a, unaware of this deep notion of wilaya. It had not begun to develop even in Shia circles, until the time of Imam al-Baqa And this will be discussed later when it comes to the ahadith, insha'Allah. So, at the beginning, even Muslims, because you're talking about people who had no comprehension of this idea, 
They were looking at the world in a certain way. They've lived from their childhood. They've grown up, certain convictions. They understand the world around them in a specific way. Suddenly, a man comes, declares prophecy, hears sounds from an angel, gives revelation, changes the whole worldview and their perception of, of everything, uh, of life around themselves. And in such a short period of time, so really, uh, these notions are not embedded in them yet. The, the time span is so short that such a deep concept, especially an esoteric one, it requires usually generations to be understood. There are many prerequisites that we have to have in order for us to understand this notion. You can't just start out knowing everything from the beginning. Um, so, the Quran comes and begins putting a specific scenario in our minds. It talks about Adam being an individual who lived in a heavenly state or lived in heaven, whichever interpretation you prefer. It won't change the uh, point we're trying to make over here. So it gives an account of Adam and Adam uh, and his wife Eve eating from the tree and uh, descending upon earth and therefore man has to live on earth. There begins the dichotomy of God and Satan. That's where the, the account begins. There's God, created Adam, Satan comes into the uh, scenario, talks to Adam and Eve, or whichever one, convinces them to go against God's order and God's will. So now we see here, in this scenario, God, Satan, man, basically. And we see a struggle between uh, God and the Satan, basically. Adam and Eve enjoyed living under the wilayah of God. They were enjoying that heavenly state that they were in. Then they fall prey to Satan's deception. Then they descend and an enmity was established between humankind and Satan. And this is basically the battle between good and evil. Always struggling, being pulled from one side to the other. Without this story, without this account, we're not able to understand Wilaya in its proper sense. Once you understand your life as being originated in a heavenly state, and the reason why you're not in that state anymore is because you're being pulled towards the authority and the influence of an evil entity, then what you have to be doing throughout your life is trying to disconnect yourself from that evilness and move towards goodness. Without this conceptualization, you will not move towards God and you will not understand uh, your relationship with God in this kind of manner. Now, to come to Wilaya and uh, see, how, see how it works as a focus word, we have Wilaya in the center here. If we survey the Qur'an, we find that there are specific notions that occur or come with Wilaya. So, the first main ones we have is that we have the Wilaya of Allah and we have the Wilaya of Shaitan, opposing that. We have the wilayah of the Prophet, and we have the enemies of the Prophet. Those are awliya as well. Disbelievers and believers. Um, we have Khidlan over here, and we have Nusra, assistance, abandonment. We have Kufr, which is disbelief, and we have Iman, and we have, which is belief. Disobedience and obedience. And there are more keywords also that are connected to wilaya. But once you want to understand the Islamic concept of wilaya, all of this stuff comes to your mind. If you obey God, you're under the wilaya of God. If you disobey God, you're under the wilaya of shaitan. So obedience is connected to wilaya. The disobedience is connected to wilaya. If you're a mu'min, you're connected to that wilaya of God. If you're a kafir, you're connected to the wilaya of shaitan. So this is why you can't translate the word into English. That's why when we saw the definitions, 
there are many different definitions of wilaya, but this specific wilaya that the Quran talks about does not have an English equivalent because authority in English has nothing to do with, this, with these notions over here. The submission of humans to God equals the entering the sphere of God's wilaya and exiting the sphere of Satan's wilaya. God says, إِنَّمَا ذَلِكُمُ الشَّيْطَانُ يُخَوِّفُ أَوْلِيَاءَهُ فَلَا تَخَافُوهُمْ وَخَافُونِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ That is only Satan sowing fear of his awliya, his friends. That's the translation chosen over here. So fear them not, but fear me if you are believers. If you fear God, what happens? Allahu waliyu alladheena amanu. If you become a wali of God and God becomes your wali, then God is the wali of those who believe. So again, belief is connected to wilaya and God is connected to wilaya. He brings them out of darkness into the light. As for those who disbelieve, their awliya are the idols, bringing them out of the light into the darkness. This denotes a spiritual connection between God and humans in general, following a peculiar, peculiar type of wilaya between God and the believers. So God has wilaya, or a connection with all of humankind, and there's a specific type of wilaya that he has over the believers, which the believers also share with God as well. So, um, I'm thinking we'll end at this slide so that we don't uh, take too long, inshallah. So, in addition to designating a relationship between Satan and his followers, it designated a relationship between the disbelievers themselves. So, Shaitan is the wali of the disbelievers. وَالَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا بَعْضُهُمْ أَوْلِيَاءُ بَعْضُ And as for those who disbelieve, they are awliya of one another. So, if we want to draw this, I can't draw it over here, um, we have the shaitan being the head of the, uh, his followers, and then the followers themselves also have wilaya between one another. So if we see this, we understand that wilaya is this connection between all of these different entities. Wilaya also extends it as a relation between the believers themselves. وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتُ بَعْضُهُمْ أَوْلِيَاءُ بَعْضُ So the mu'mineen have a relationship of wilaya between one another. From this stems responsibilities of a mu'min towards, uh, towards his brother or sister in Iman. And this is why we have that um, a person, the Prophet ﷺ says that the nation, the Islamic nation, is like a body of a human being. If one part, uh, part of that body feels pain, the other parts suffer with it or feel with it. So basically denoting this unity and this spiritual uni unity between these different creatures. So you enter the realm of wilaya of God, you automatically spiritually connect with all the mu'mineen uh, uh, that are also under the wilayah of God. And this has an existential effect as well. The, the arwah of the mu'mineen are connected to one another. And there's a lot of interesting ahadith that talk about this. Once we understand what wilayah is referring to, those ahadith begin to make sense. Uh, God says, but the believing men and believing women are awliya of one another enjoining right and forbidding evil, performing the prayer, giving the alms, and obeying God and His Messenger. They are those upon God, whom God will have mercy. Truly God is mighty. So we even have a, uh, uh, a connection with God that allows God's mercy to come upon us if we enter that realm of wilayah, the sphere of wilayah. God also commands the believers not to take the disbelievers as awliya. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لَا تَتَّخِذُوا الْكَافِرِينَ أَوْلِيَاءَ مِنْ دُونِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ أَتُرِيدُونَ أَنْ تَجْعَلُوا لِلَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ سُلْطَانًا الْمُبِينَ O oh, you who believe, do not take the disbelievers as awliya instead of the believers. So, we're connecting the awliya into one circle, and they should be disconnected from the disbelievers who are in another circle, and they are also connected with one another. So, we'll end uh, over here this week. Inshallah, next week we'll continue from here. We'll, ser we'll survey the verses specifically that talk about the, uh, the Quranic uh, usages in more detail and see which words are connected with one another. And uh, hopefully we can uh, finish that, then move on to the ahadith and see how this spiritual relationship between the awliya uh, reflects in, in the real world. If is it real? Or is it just something that is in our minds? Are there existential effects also? Or is it only something that God 
made in order for us to govern our lives and organize our lives as human beings. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa sallallahu ala muhammadan wa ala ahli bayti al-tayyibin al-tahirin. Allah. Allah.